Hi, this is Paul. Working on the net here. Didn't make a PowerPoint. It's usually a bad sign. But yesterday I did a conversation with Julian. Two hour conversation. I know a lot of you don't watch the conversations. Can't blame you. Can't, wouldn't blame you for not watching the channel. But it was an awesome conversation with Julian. Uh, really went well. And we were all over the place. A lot of fun to have. Don't know if it's as much fun to listen to, but there it is. Julian had sent me this conversation between Robert Wright and John Caputo. Now, Wright is a very interesting guy. He's got bloggingheads.tv, and he's also got meaningoflife.tv, and he's um, over in the Buddhist uh, camp, And but has a lot of interesting things on his channel, and I think he really does a good job with a lot of these conversations. And here is a conversation with John Caputo. I first heard John Caputo years ago when a friend of mine, a friend who's been on the channel, Pete Vanderbeek, uh, pointed me to a bunch of CBC, uh, a bunch of CBC podcasts, basically after God, post theism, and Caputo was on there. And Caputo is, as Wright will have him describe. Uh, postmodern Christianity. What's really good about this video, this conversation, and boy, I'd love to go through the whole thing. We'll see if uh, see if there's time for that today for me. But Caputo does a really nice job, just kind of laying things out in a pretty simple way. And of course, so I, one of the comments on my conversation with Julian is, you know, I should address postmodernity more directly. I'm not a philosopher. I'm a pastor, and Julian and I got a bit into James K. Smith, who is a philosopher. He teaches at my alma mater, Calvin College, and as Julian's been reading quite a bit of James K. Smith, um, Smith, uh, in, in many ways, has sort of been doing what I've been doing in terms of trying to engage what where theology goes in terms of postmodernity. And so Smith winds up with a lot of Augustine. Uh, Verveke knows Augustine quite well. And, and after Smith talked at Rebel Wisdom, I think, I think a Verveke, I think a Verveke, James K. Smith conversation would be good if James would have a good understanding of what Verveke is doing. Part of the problem of so many academic or celebrity convert or especially celebrity academic conversations on the internet is that when the two parties don't know each other's work it's usually just kind of like these political debates it's a side-by-side -side lecture where there's some tangential meeting and and they can't really get into the issues but I wanted to play some of this conversation. Actually, the whole conversation is really very good, and I've got a lot of comments on the whole thing, so we'll see what I can get through. But first, Wright starts out just with some basic stuff. Tell me what postmodernity is about. Now, Caputo doesn't have any good sound equipment in his office, and so his voice is not in good shape in this recording, which is a shame. So you might really struggle to... To hear it and understand it, and my experience has been that's often worse for the people listening on the on the podcast only side of things. But let's let's see what happens. Uh, yeah, it did. So, um, so for starters, people probably heard. I mean, lately, postmodernism has been in the news because people like Jordan Peterson condemn it as uh, being what's wrong with America and the. I should do a sound check. World. For starters, do you want to... Uh, the church and the king. But it ends... Test, 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 test. Uh, in, in, in. Test, 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 test. Hi, this is Paul. I want to do a video on some commentary on this Robert Wright, John Caputo video. Um, Robert Wright has his bloggingheads.tv where you can find Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter and their outstanding conversations. Um, I really appreciate a lot of the way Robert Wright goes about these interviews and these conversations on his channel. I, I'm always surprised his channel doesn't get more attention than it does. But John Caputo, I first heard about John Caputo oh, a number of years ago when Peter Vanderbeek, who's been on the channel, he's a pastor up in Edmonton, a CRC pastor, 
he posted on CRC Voices a bunch of CBC, really outstanding CBC podcasts. They were a radio program, I'm sure, first, um, After God or Post Theism. And that was a really helpful introduction to me about a bunch of contemporary thinkers. If you're a minister in a conservative denomination, moderate denomination like the Christian Reformed Church, you don't read a lot of contemporary theology often, because, especially if you're a pastor, because contemporary theology may or may not be helping people the way a lot of people, especially in churches, want to be helped. But Caputo is an interesting case. So Caputo, at least according to Robert Wright's interview of him, is going to talk about postmodern Christianity. And as Robert Wright's about to introduce, he says, you know, a lot of people don't know what postmodernity means. Somebody, I, Julian was the one who sent me this video, and the commenter said, you should treat some of this postmodernity stuff more directly. And that commenter had a point, and so perhaps this video is a good place to start. This video is actually quite excellent because it's very clear. Caputo's um, very articulate. He's very, he, he puts his ideas out there clearly, and I listened to this conversation and when julian sent it to me you know julian was right julian's a very careful listener he was right that a lot of this stuff touches on a lot of what i've done with my channel so let's jump into it and hear some of it um so for starters people probably heard i mean lately postmodernism has been in the news because people like jordan peterson condemn it as uh being what's wrong with america and the world for starters do you want to tell us if there are any like major misconceptions about it i mean i think a lot of people think of postmodernism as something that's like opposed to the idea of objective truth uh and if not like anti-science kind of spending a certain amount of time undermining the credibility of science and so on these are the kinds of things people think about postmodernism is that is that way off track now, now robert wright's point here is is interesting in terms of anti-science and that's that's where some of the celebrity atheists and IDW members and people who are pushing back against the social justice critical theory tribes you know are have been have been pushing so yeah it's a fair question and I think again Caputo's Caputo's very competent here and he's very articulate and he's very clear so he's he's very helpful no 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 that's exactly right and most of my books are directed to that kind of argument the only problem is he doesn't have a good mic for this. And if, if his sound quality were better, there'd be a better video. And, okay. Uh, I'd be budding that kind of argument. Okay. Um, it's, yeah. I mean, if you think of modernity, if you want to think about the postmodern, then you've got to start out with what you mean by modern. And um, the, the sort of paradigm of modernity is uh, an ideal of pure objectivity, absolute certitude, uh, overarching a historical truth with a capital T. Now, that in, uh, actually served a purpose at one point, and that is back at the beginning of the... Now, again, I, I really like the way he lays this out in terms of modernity. And so if you look at the conversation I had with Julian, if when you heard Caputo talk like this, you thought primarily about stuff you hear in church it's because you were listening to a very modernist church or you were raised in a very modernist church truth with a capital t uh very much gets into what alvin plant again nicholas waltersdorf would talk about in terms of foundationalism that here it's very much the the kind of mode of reason that sam harris argues for that that here we can we can have certainty and certitude by constructing things up from first principles and arriving at knowledge. Now, this gets into what I call the monarchical vision of you from nowhere. This is universal, certain knowledge, truth with a capital T. Modern era of the, of the Enlightenment, it was a fairly effective way to break up the power of the church and of uh, tradition. Now, now, one of the interesting things about postmodernists is that for all of their deconstruction of narratives, they certainly tell them 
almost all the time in terms of justifying the arise of postmodernity. And what he talks about here, I talked to a little bit with Julian about it in the conversation that I've talked about this quite a bit in my earlier videos when I was going through a bunch of Jordan Peterson stuff, that the Protestant Reformation begins to undermine the the kind of cozy monopoly of power that certain regimes in conjunction with the Roman Catholic Church had in Western Europe. There's, there's no question about that. And people went looking for a new certainty and a new basis for unity. This, this story is often told in a rather abstract way about knowledge as an abstract thing, but it's, it's also as much a story about, about society in terms of how to have a unified society. And the institution of the Roman Catholic Church in Western Europe was providing that, was attempting to provide that kind of uniformity in terms of an authority structure. Now, looking back on it, it might look terrifically monolithic if you actually read history from the time it's a whole, whole lot messier at the time. And so the Enlightenment comes and, and basically begins in a, very, in a very significant way to challenge the thought assumptions and authority structures that had been prevailing in Europe. As I mentioned to Julian, if you read, there's really, a, there's really an excellent, in the Great Courses series, there's an excellent course on thoughts on capitalism and one of the things that I picked up in there is you look at someone like Voltaire who begins to notice that the, the Muslim merchant and the Calvinist merchant and the Roman Catholic merchant and the Jewish merchant, you know, all of these groups might have their, and the Lutheran, might have their wars, but when they're, when they're conducting commerce on the dock, they can all get along. And, and this is where you have the rise of the secular space. And, and, and partly because it's, it arises in this space, its deep connection with Christianity, which is what Tom Holland has been noticing in his books. And I, hopefully I'll remember to include a link to a, an article that recently is out in Mere Orthodoxy by Peter Lightheart on the work of John Milbank and Radical Orthodoxy, again, something that Julian and I talked about in our conversation. That, that, that secularity became an alternate, became an alternate church, as it were, but not so much an institutional church, but an organic church. Uh, there grew a society and some institutional societies of reason and thought based not on revealed text and scriptures. Remember in the, in the Renaissance, you had this, this turn towards the text and all the excitement about rediscovering Greek and Latin. And of course, Aristotle had been, had been worked into theology by Thomas Aquinas well, there's this, this turn from the text after the Reformation as Luther clearly demonstrated that the Protestants were not going to create a new monolithic structure to rival the Roman Catholic Church in its ability to create a coherent um, organic and institutional home for the people of Europe. And so now on the basis of, you know, the, the, the Enlightenment is always split between the empiricists and the rationalists, that these two sources of empiricism and rationalism now perhaps could be the basis of a new unity. And, and we might argue that this this unity doesn't really come about. These things take hundreds of years to develop. But, but the new institution that, that we find in our, in our contemporary period, the new institution that would arise would, would likely be the 
the university, um, untethered from its Christian, the umbilical cord to the church being severed in the 19th century, a la Darwin and many others. So the it isn't until really the 19th and the, really the 20th century until the 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 university as institution replaces the church as the source of the kind of let's say competent secular i want to say wisdom but if i say wisdom i mean it in the hebrew sense by which the nation can be run by which life can be put together okay so this is where when i just kind of go freestyling here without uh, without a, a plan or a powerpoint things can things can tend to wander but the story that john caputo starts talking about here really culminates in and, and especially after the cold war George Marsden wrote a really fine book. Um, I guess it run a Bancroft Award or something. I don't know that award. But a really fine book, The Twilight of the American Enlightenment. And if you combine that with his other book about the, um, basically the, the secularization of the American universities, you, you get a pretty clear picture of what Caputo was saying here about, well, the Enlightenment sort of replaces the the dominant agreement and institutions of the church based on the written word and the the, the enlightenment and and a scientific approach to the world takes to heads to the front of the line and paved the way for modern emancipated thinking and emancipated thinking emancipated from what exactly well emancipated from the doctrines and dogmas and uh, institutions of the church now you didn't need to look at a book you could look at nature and apply reason as opposed to say luther's imaginings which would be applying reason to the bible and and you can discern now you can discern truth now luther isn't going to go away and in some senses the the fundamentalist the, the fundamentalist institutions and approach will continue to try to rival the secular approach but as we've seen in the latter part of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century um doesn't really hold its own in the in the popular political spheres of power in the West and modern democratic life uh, because it it shattered the uh, the the old absolutism of, of the church and the king but it ended up uh, in, in, installing a new absolutism of pure reason and um, what postmodernists say is, uh, I like to say that postmodernism is a continuation of what was started in modernity, which is, let's say, emancipation. But by an again, it, it, I mean, you just it's so you just throw that out as emancip emancipation from what exactly? Well, it's emancipation from all of the things that let's say Sam Harris keeps complaining about. Emancipation from imagining we are getting truth from an ancient book see and this is where again i think jordan peterson is important in a response to post-modernity and i know carl took issue with the assertion that julian and i made which is that and i think julian in the comment section addressed it rightly that 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 Peterson, it's important to understand Peterson in a postmodern context, and in that sense, Peterson is situated in postmodernity. And I would argue that by virtue of Peterson's the success in irritating the postmodernists, 
Peterson have, was able to understand and assimilate sufficiently a lot of the thinking and tricks to to really engage it in a critical way. Another means, and, so let's say emancipation, but by another means, and, and that is so. And it's important to, to continue to think this through here. I'm never going to get through this video. That, that much is clear by now. But emancipation from what? Again, again, emancipation from what was in the Renaissance period and late medieval period, The you find truth in a text. Now we're emancipated from the text and we're going to find truth out there in the natural order. And this is where, again, Jordan Peterson's conversation with with Sam Harris is vitally important because Sam Harris is a thoroughgoing going modernist and says, well, I just see the natural order and I engage it directly. And Peterson says, no, there's, a, there's an a priori structure that you are viewing it through. So you might imagine you are emancipated from the text, but postmodernity comes along and says, you're not emancipated from the filters through which you view the world. You don't see the world directly. You are viewing the world through a structure. Now, what is that structure? Now, again, back through all of the Peterson and Verveke stuff. The, the structure, why is there a structure between myself and the world? Why can I only see the world through eyes and not directly? Why don't I have access to this monarchical vision? Well, I don't because th there is too much world out there and I myself am too limited. And so minimally there is a filtering structure and I have to select elements of that world with which to see and engage and the selection of those elements is pre-conscious and pre-rational. So we might be emancipated from the text but we are not emancipated from the self which is of which my conscious chooser is just a tiny part. There are parts of me that are doing all sorts of choosing and sorting and pre-filtering, and then all of that choosing and sorting and pre-filtering is going to get worked into the ways that I now exert power and control and narratives into the world. Uh, eventually, at a certain point, we got to see that uh, tr truth, truth doesn't drop out of the sky, either sent either by God or by pure reason. Okay, so truth doesn't drop out of the sky. Now, quite literally, and this is where I've often engaged people with respect to how Sam Harris is, is, is simply not being fair to huge parts of the church that imagine something like organic inspiration as opposed to mechanical inspiration, where you've got ideas of of in Mormonism, for example, the translation of the Book of Mormon, or you've got ideas of Muhammad and the Quran, whereas in Christianity, the Word of God are all written by human beings, and God works through the culture and the times and the person to arrive at the Bible. Okay, that's a that's a that's a way of understanding the text from an inspiration from. A, a posture of organic inspiration. Truth is something that we we discover in the concrete, in ambiguous situations, in which um, what we mean by truth is the best interpretation available at the moment, keeping our fingers crossed, hoping it gets us through the day, knowing that tomorrow morning things may change. Okay. Truth now, and, and there's a slight thing, instead of truth being these things that drop out of the sky, capital T, they're, 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 they're completely apart from context, and they speak to everything and anything apart from context. Now, if you notice the subtleness in, his, in what he's talking about, truth is contextual, and it helps to get us through the day, and we can already see some pragmatism coming in here and and truth is instrumental and again what often gets forgotten and postmodernity is trying to include it is that truth is being seen and used and manipulated by wanters 
and and people with agendas in order to to get outcomes they desire now i think that part is compatible with science as a lot of people see science right you, you all you ever know is that you've got the most effective theory for the time being that's right i mean in in no small part postmodern theory developed out of people working in the philosophy of science who who saw that real science in practice is not the, the absolutistic illusion that we think it is. It is very much bound by instincts, by intuitions. When Now, what he's saying here is really important because he seems later in the video to forget what he's saying here. When scientific ideas break through, they are at that moment unlikely. They're implausible. They're held in suspicion. They're doubted. They're ridiculed. And all the weight of evidence is on the old idea, the, what, what Kuhn called, Thomas Kuhn called the old paradigm. So what happens is this, this expression, paradigm shifts, is that frameworks change and they, at the moment of change, at the moment of crisis, they look highly implausible. And it's only because of the, uh, the resoluteness and the ingenuity and the creativity of the authors of the new paradigm that they succeed. So the, one of the more important predecessor figures of postmodernism is Thomas Kuhn, who wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, who said, look, instead of philosophizing about science, study the actual history of science and you'll discover that it is a lot of very concrete work on the ground, a lot of uh, seat of the pants thinking, which um, is very human, very, uh, and he compared it to a political revolution. Right, and he also... And, and now seat of the pants thinking is a very interesting turn of phrase in this, because again, and this will get into some of the Verveke stuff, that there's insight and... and and so then you've got flow states and process and you're trying to get at all of that. I, I want to put in a plug for this video. This is on Karen, Karen's channel, The Meaning Code. Karen's channel is a small channel and I've had a couple of conversations with Karen. I've had a couple of conversations with Michael here too. And, and this, this conversation I think actually bears quite a bit um, in common. common. It, it touches on some of the same issues and you know, part of what, you know, part of what the point that Michael made in this video at one point is that this kind of skepticism is is really at the heart of science. And in fact, scientists practice this kind of skepticism. It's part and parcel of what science is about. And so, you know, I just want to emphasize the point that Caputo was making that Thomas Kuhn comes along with the structures of scientific revolutions and demonstrates that science is not just this thing out there, but is actually a human activity and human beings have their fingerprints all over science. So, and he also said, I mean, to further kind of undermine the, the, the most naive narrative about science, he noted that very often the new paradigm doesn't convince many people, the, the, the adherents to the old paradigm go to their graves believing in it. What has to happen is that new people are born who aren't in, in, thrall, in the thrall of the old world view, right? So now let me ask you a big term. You know, I, I've, I've, uh, I've listened to, to uh, some of your lectures, a big term for you, and I gather in postmodern theory, is deconstruction. It, now, is it the case that uh, postmodernists uh, would see the decline of a, a paradigm, the blowing up of a paradigm, as part of an historical process of deconstruction? Yeah, sure. You would. And, and, and you see this in other realms, too. Now, the word deconstruction is, again, one of these words that we just kind of throw out there and is used, and we don't pause and ask ourselves, oh, what, 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 what do you mean by deconstruction? Sort of like emancipation. Well, we're, we're emancipated, and nobody bothers, few people bother to pause and say, uh, from what and to what? Well, deconstructed. Well, from what and to what? Well, deconstructed, you are, you are basically saying that here's this narrative or here's this vision that you have 
that seems enchanted and magical but what you're doing is that you're taking you're, you're looking at it with new eyes and you're looking at the pieces of it and you're finding all of the mechanisms within it and what you've discovered is that when you've looked at the mechanisms someone has an agenda now, now this is really interesting because the you're going from an enchanted perspective where this is this is truth with the capital of T. This thing has dropped down from heaven. This is not only the way things are. These are the way things are on purpose. These are the way, the way things are supposed to be. And now you've said, well, let's deconstruct it. Now there's all these little operations beneath that we can say, oh, the, the end piece looks enchanted, sort of like a piece of technology, like, a, like an iPhone, let's say. But underneath it's really little bits and then you take another note to take another move that says not only is it not only can we deconstruct it and see that it's not magical or enchanted or the product of some great universal mind but it's it's a it's a product of lots of lesser agents who have a plan for your life where they are going to profit at your expense and so that's that has become all part of this deconstruction motif that figures prominently in postmodernity. too right you in in art uh, a, a prevailing art paradigm will get deconstructed and give way to something else and that's one of the markers, that, that's exactly right. And, and one of the things that happens in postmodern theory is instead of dividing things into the humanities and the sciences, you, you replace that distinction with a distinction between normal science or the reigning paradigm and the revolutionary one. And see, it's right here at this move where you know, before we were talking about the history of science and suddenly we're talking about politics. Now suddenly, and this is brings us back to Robert Wright's initial point, is, postmodern, is postmodernity anti-scientific? Well, right here at this point, you can see why that happens because in a sense, sciences are consumed by humanity you've deconstructed this enchanted process or this enchanted worldview or this enchanted narrative and you've now seen the underworking constituent parts of it and you've noted the grubby little the grubby little fingerprints of people who wish to exploit the um those who are used by the grand narrative for their own selfish ends. And this is part of the reason why the term hermeneutic of suspicion comes in, because it's not just suspicion that there is no God and the ancient vision can be deconstructed into mechanistic elements, but that sub-agents who have wittingly or unwittingly created these sub elements are responsible and even and culpable for basically victimizing the former tools of the enchanted image and that distinction cuts across both science and the humanities so you see things you see peep figures in theology like Luther, in painting like Picasso, in science like uh, Einstein. It, it's a little muddy to hear. In theology like Luther, in painting like Picasso, in science like Einstein. You see exactly the same kind of pattern. You, you see an established paradigm, a moment of crisis, a revolutionary change. So. There's an established paradigm, a moment of crisis, and a revolutionary change. And again, ironically, this then becomes the dominant narrative of postmodernity that had been deconstructing all the narratives. But this narrative itself 
won't get deconstructed or can't get deconstructed and Caputo's going to talk about that and that's that's actually a very very interesting point and that turns out to be a characteristic of human intelligence which weakens the division between natural sciences and humanity when Kuhn called, spoke of scientific revolutions that was very scandalous because he was comparing it to a political revolution Mm -hmm. So so Thomas Kuhn comes into here, and before, in the modernist worldview, well, so, so modernism, I've, I've spoken about this before, too, in, again, videos that I've made a year or two ago. What happens in modernity is that, at least especially in the United States during the Cold War, I mean, this stuff gets very recent, that science can tell us what is... Religion will tell us what ought. Okay, now there, there you see, a, again, a mapping of the scientific image and the manifest image. Okay, and so then science will tell us what is, and we can learn what we can do through technology via science. Religion revealed in a book tells us what ought to be. Okay, so that was one way of of having a compromise from so that the complete ancient world wasn't deconstructed because just because you know what is and what can doesn't mean you know what should so you rely on the bible and revealed truth and god for what should be and you rely on science for what is but now thomas kuhn comes along and says yeah but all your your is stuff is politics too now kuhn doesn't take that turn but once Kuhn Thomas Kuhn exposes that oh science science isn't just purely something out there apart from us we have all of our grubby little fingerprints all over science too um, now now it gets pulled into politics and so they, his critics said well he's turning science over to mob rule and, but, but in fact, he was saying... Mob rule or democratic or committees. Is, uh, you, you, human intelligence is, 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 is very similar, whether it's doing science or it's doing poetry or, or painting. There's a, a movement between normal and revolutionary. Paradigms get established, and once they're established, they hold on, and they should hold on. And they should hold on as long as they can, because otherwise there'll be chaos. If everything were revolutionary, there would, there would just be chaos. Okay. Actually, James Joyce had a wonderful expression for this. He uses the expression chaosmos. Mm -hmm. So you have a moment, a moment of chaos, but it's only a moment. It's a moment in uh, of disruption of the of the order of the cosmos, and that chaosmic moment is what's created. If there were only order, there would never be any progress. If there were only chaos, there would be only chaos. And so, you know, modernism likes to think like that. It likes to weaken these oppositional categories. Mm -hmm. um, it likes to think in terms of insight. Um, it, it weakens the notion of method and strengthens the notion of insight and creative breakthrough. Um, and, this is, and so there's always a certain amount of questioning. Mm -hmm. So deconstruction is just one version of this. So there are various versions of it. The, the one I like is deconstruction. It's the one that's most congenial to me. And it's saying every, whatever has been constructed is deconstructible. To be deconstructible is not to simply destroy something or to... Or to uh, denounce its, its value, but it's to, it's to claim its reformability. It's like a law. Okay, now that's a crucial thing. It's Deconstruction claims its reformability, but there's also a revelatory moment of uh, insight in there that, oh, I thought that the way things were and the processes that yield out, I thought this was God's will now I see that this is only the
the product of human beings, of, of plastic moldable human beings. And so with the, the critical theory promoters out there, well, if this is only the product of human beings, if human beings made it, then we as human beings can remake it according to, and I'm jumping ahead in his conversation, a more just situation. Now, anybody who's looked at this long enough can anticipate the next move to say, now, wait a minute, we've learned the deconstruction process and we've learned that this supposedly magical, enchanted vision of the world was just constructed by human beings and so therefore can be reconstructed by human beings and the human beings that constructed this had grubby little dirty hands that were contaminated by their own desires for their own advantages and the maintenance of their own power as compared to other persons what makes you so pure that you can reconstruct a world that is more just won't the reconstruction of the world that you promote have all of the same dirty little fingerprints of your individual agendas, known or unknown? What makes you a safe person? And and people will there's often a there's often a an insinuation, it's seldom articulated, that well, I'm a safe person because I have been a victim. Oh. Well, that sounds lovely. But what that's premised on is the assumption that people are basically good and when people that that the people who have victimized others have done so in ignorance that they didn't know they were going to hurt anyone yeah, that's, and and so now since i have been the victim of someone else and because people don't willingly hurt other people then i will then be able to be in charge and i will be the benevolent system creator that will create a system which will which will finally bring justice now anybody who's actually worked with human beings should be aware of the fact that this too is a story and it's a story that doesn't really work very well and there's all kinds of sayings such as hurt people hurt people that people who have been constructed people have been victims by certain things often have, wittingly or unwittingly, within them the, the means to get even and try and undo that. The, the parent, the child of a controlling parent, sometimes is overindulgent. And then the child of the overindulgent um, parent sometimes becomes controlling. And what you see with human beings is usually a, a back and forth between you know, between poles of, of, of a whole variety of areas trying to get things right. First, they weren't controlling enough. Now they're too controlling. And generation by generation, back and forth, back and forth, each time victimizing another generation, never actually finding justice in the midst. It's just the repetition of, of new and different things. But his point now is once we see that the world that we have is not just floated down from the sky, is not the product of some god, is not, not the product of, of, some, of some whole, um, that some omnipresent, omniscient, benevolent monarch, but it is just the product of accident and chance and people with grubby little interests, well... We, of course, will do better than our ancestors. There's a lot of chronological snobbery that gets loaded into this thing, too. We will do better than our ancestors, and we will now suddenly get the system right because all situations have been constructed. Law is one of the better examples, actually, of it. A, a law, if a law is not appealable and repealable, it becomes a monster. And... That's true in art, it's true in science, it's true in religion, it's true in jurisprudence, it's true, period. 
if a law is not repealable, and again, the, let's watch the subtext, repealable by us, then that law becomes a monster. Now, what about the laws of physics? Do, does that law, because what, you know, if you're paying attention, he's just said a law. Is that law true of itself? Will, will this law become a monster? If something is not dynamic, if it's not reformable, if it's not able to reinvent itself, it becomes a monster. Mm -hmm. So the theory... Now again, if you listen to Sam Harris, Sam Harris will say almost this identical thing to Jordan Peterson in the debates. That And, and Matt Dillahunty actually makes the point more clearly and more often that our hope is that all of these things are... See, it's in this way that even modernists like Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty, these ideas, once they get into us, we, we, we can't help but wield them. And so you find modernists implementing these, these postmodern arguments in the cause of their modernism because it's a powerful argument. The difficulty is that there's an assumption deep in the argument that people mean well and people will do the right thing it's like well sometimes people mean well and sometimes people do the right thing but but don't forget that built into this whole thing is already a hermeneutic of suspicion that says eh, i'm not so sure and there's chronological snobbery that says well ancient people were ignorant modern people know more so we'll do better can you really demonstrate that one or give an argument for that one well, they say, sure, look at the technology that we have. The difficulty, of course, that you have is what yardstick for better will you employ to make the argument against whether life is better today or yesterday? The construction is a theory of protecting us against monsters. And the other thing to remember about this word deconstruction is that... Um, the notion of, of the deconstructible implies, by definition, really, the notion of what's undeconstructible. So that there's always a certain kind of aspiration or hope for what we're what we're trying to do, what we're trying to get done. What? Okay, I want to play this again because the point he makes here is crucial to a ton of stuff, and and he's kind of hard to hear. Kind of. Like, the notion of what's undeconstructible implies, by definition, really, the notion of what's undeconstructible. So the notion of that, well, this, this, this world that we've been born into and inherited, we learn that this is deconstructible, that implies that there might be out there something which is undeconstructible. Because, well, modernism doesn't fully go away. It gets subsumed. And what happens with subsumption is that, yeah, I know it sounds terribly Hegelian here, but what happens with subsumption is that modernism doesn't really completely go away. It just gets built on. Another layer comes up on it. So that there's always a certain kind of aspiration or hurt. There's always a certain kind of aspiration or hurt. All right, And both of them are vitally important because people... These are the motivations within people that move them to action. And there's an aspiration. You see a goal out there. And a little while later, they're going to talk about telos. There's a goal out there. There's something out there desired that they wish to attain or at least have the community to attain. Or there's a hurt that needs to be addressed. There's redress that is that needs to come into the system. And so you have the deconstructible and you have the undeconstructible. And, well, if you're paying attention now, the aspiration or the hurt are going to become the undeconstructible. For what we're, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to get done, what's going on, well, and, and, and can't be held captive by the present. Right. right. And, and can I say, as I understand your theology, uh, this is an important part of uh, part of it. And I, I mean, maybe we should back up and say, as I understand your theology, 
one thing it involves uh, focusing on the question of like what drives guides drives energizes whatever you want to say the ongoing process of deconstruction right what what, what is the um, uh, and and ultimately you 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 start putting emphasis on a term the unconditional and and so on and we'll we'll get to all that um, I want to um, and, and, and it ultimately has to do with, with our aspirations and our dreams and so on in a certain sense. Uh, and, and, um, but, but I want to pause and make sure we understand kind of uh, the process itself, this process of ongoing historical change. Now, I gather that deconstructionists, well, postmodernists, put, put tremendous emphasis on language as a system and on the importance of language as a system. And one question I have is, am I to understand that in, in your world, in your view, language is in some sense fundamental? And, and by that, I mean to, to provide. Now, this is a place of the video I can skip. And again, it's not a bad conversation, not a bad part of the conversation, but it's not highlighting the part of the narrative that I want to focus on. Now when, now, when you get to the question of the undeconstructable, this immediately brings to my mind this conversation between Benjamin Boyce and James Lindsay, where they talk about this. I'll just let it play, because I remember watching this and thinking, yeah, that's the, the older crew. So this is actually really interesting. Our contention, so this is where Thaddeus and I would hit our disagreement. Um, our contention is that, yes, indeed, social justice is postmodern, but it has, in the sense of using postmodern methods, but it's taken up a meta narrative, which is what postmodernism is supposed to be wholly skeptical of. And that meta narrative started, I mean, it came from the, the leftist politics and views that were always buried within, the, say, the original French philosophers and sociologists, but it took on a new character in the 1980s. Because again, I mean, you're, here's, here, here's the problem with the hermeneutic of suspicion it, it applies to everything. And so you have this vision by the French philosophers who say, ah, oh, wait a minute, there, there are dirty fingerprints all over this thing too. In the 80s and 1990s, under the, most two pro the two most prominent figures in this regard would have been um, Judith Butler working in queer theory, but more importantly, Kimberly Crenshaw working in critical race, uh, critical, I'm gonna call it critical race theology, critical race theory, and- Oh, it is theology, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, critical legal critical race legal theory. Uh, yeah, she is the progenitor of intersectionality. She came up with that term in a paper in 1989 and then went to, to pretty, pretty, went, pretty much went to town defining and clarifying its need in 1991. And at that point, what happened was, um, and this is the birth of the meta narrative, like I said, though, that it came out of previous existing political roots. They said that um, you can't do political work, and Kimberly Crenshaw is explicit about what kind of political work, identity political work. You can't do identity politics unless, if you're willing to deconstruct everything, including identity. So she said, we're going to start by saying that the postmodern thinkers went too far. They have so in other words, again, there's, if you've got the deconstructable, there has to be the undeconstructable. Because if you deconstruct everything, then you're in this chaos. So there, there must be something you don't deconstruct. The valuable tools that we will employ. They had valuable insights that we should draw upon, but ultimately they were operating from a place of privilege that allowed them to deconstruct even oppression. Oppression based on identity in particular. And it's a mark of their privilege that prevented them from being able to realize that they were acting in privilege. So okay. you could almost say that Kimberly Crenshaw's big idea would be where you have Descartes trying to drill down, I don't want to maybe blow her up to this big of a stature like Descartes, but who knows, where you have Descartes drilling down to what's one thing I know I can say is true, and he comes out with cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Here you have Kimberly Crenshaw drilling down, saying what can I know is true. And, and now, again, Descartes not a bad guy to point to in this because I think therefore I am well 
I have the experience of thinking. I'm experienced thinking. I'm experiencing thinkingness. Therefore, I am. It's not a big jump to the next thing. True. After postmodern deconstruction says that there is no such thing as as accessible truth, and she drills down and she says, "I am oppressed. Therefore, I am." So I'm, I'm experiencing thinkingness. Therefore, I am. There must be a subject to that. Now I'm experiencing oppression. Therefore, I am, and that then become can become the basis. This is the undeconstructible. And so she, following Bell Hooks, a black, a very famous black uh, feminist at the time, following um, her, came out with a statement that said, "There's a fundamental and important difference, especially if you wish to do identity politics, between the statement, I am black, I take on black identity." versus I am a person who happens to be black, which would be the prevailing liberal colorblind, if you will, interpretation of how to deal with the social constructions around race. In other words, personhood, now we're getting into a little deeper philosophy, personhood has certain attributes. Blackness might be an attribute. Um, and But the person is, is sort of the the, subs, the, sub, the substrata here upon which the attri attributes which may or may not, the attributes can be accidental. Now it's the oppression, just like it's the thinkingness. I'm, I'm having a thinking experience. Something must be having that thinking experience, therefore I am. Something must be having that oppressive, oppressive experience, therefore I am. Okay. So that amness uh, then provides you uh, an anchor in this postmodern world. So the postmodern world is everything is constantly being deconstructed. We're in a sea of chaos, and everything that we assemble out of that is, uh, is tentative at best. Uh, whereas this is trying to say or, or reserve one space or one access to objective reality which is, I guess, the cornerstone. All now, objective, one access to that which can't be deconstructed. Whether you can find it as an object, I'm going to find the experience of depression as an object, well, I can bear witness to it, but, you know, I'm looking around for my experience of, of, of oppression. Did I leave it in a drawer someplace? It's not an object. Also of subjective experience being one's identity. And insofar yes. as one's identity is oppressed, that magnifies that identity, that makes that identity more real than other identities. Would you would you say that that's fair? In a that way? Is, yeah, that's fair. That's correct. It also makes it more salient and something that people need to pay more attention to and focus okay. upon. Okay, so they talked about language a bit there, and I skipped some of that just for the sake of um, not having to have Carl freak out too much over Wittgenstein. Um <laughs> Back, 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 back to history here and some other topics that we've been playing around with on our channel. Back to uh, the religious aspect of your worldview, uh, this idea of like uh, postmodern um, Christianity. Uh, the, uh, so a question arises again. Um, well, let's look at the, the question that arises in traditional Christianity and biblical Christianity. You know, history is happening. These stuff happens. What is guiding it? What is the point? What is the, you know, is, is it being, uh, is it being drawn teleologically to some future? Uh, was there a prime mover that set it in motion or both the case? Did the, and, and Christianity's, in, in traditional Christianity's, I would say biblical Christianity's idea is both are yes. There was a prime mover who set it in motion with an end in mind. So there is a purpose to history, it's heading somewhere intelligible, and there's a reason. So uh, it seems to me that there is something that your inquiry has in common with that, right? I mean, you, you're looking at history as postmodernists might depict it as you have these, these systems that seem stable and then they change, uh, new systems arise in these various realms, art, science, religion itself, that's history, social structure, presumably, that collectively, that's history. And I think you're asking the question, well, what is, what is guiding or drawing or inspiring the process of deconstruction, right? Because deconstruction is the process of history as you see it. It's 
systems continue to get deconstructed, new ones arise, then they get deconstructed. And then you, very, we're getting very Hegelian here. You want to ask the question, what is the, what's beneath the deconstruction more fundamentally? What guides, inspires, whatever, energizes? That, is, that, is that much true about what no, you're that, doing? That's quite right, yeah, that's good. And so then what is your answer? My answer is, uh, I, I, I like the, this expression which you used uh, earlier on, the notion of something unconditional. So it, it, the, way, the way I like to divide things up or to articulate them is to distinguish between something of unconditional value or importance or worth or desirability. Okay, so the unconditional, the... the 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 basic something of something that is unconditional this is this is actually if you if you've born with me this far this is actually going to connect up with a lot of the stuff we've been talking about and the conditional forms in which it's enacted so there's something unconditional beneath and then there's conditional forms in which it's enacted okay but the 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 presence of the unconditional is fundamental here or constructed. So what, the conditional is always deconstructible. It's always constructed and therefore deconstructible in virtue of some kind of unconditional aspiration or desire. So the so going back to the, the James Lindsay, Benjamin Boyce, there's an unconditional aspiration that would be the elimination of de, of, of oppression, let's say or the aspiration towards justice, that say. And that then becomes the, if you're not paying attention, that then becomes the reason for being, all right? Uh, or dream. The mythological form that takes is the, a sort of mythological theology of history, that, that, which began, you know, with, with uh, a, a, a story of our, of our first parents now, now notice the mythological is is part of the deconstructible, that there's an there's an undeconstructible, an unconditional thing beneath that manifests itself, and that we see mythologically. The mythology can of course be deconstructed, but but that's that's the process here. In the Garden of Eden, and moves to to a climax in the the culmination of world history where God will establish his reign. Well, all of that I take to be a symbolic way of, of saying something that's, that's important. Now, it's interesting. So, so okay, we have the undeconstructible, and then we have the mythos up here, and here, that's a mythological way, and and up here in the, in the mythology, we'll find the telos, all right? Because that was Robert Wright's question. Where's, is there a telos? Is it draw, pulling history? That seems to be what biblical Christianity is about that things were made for a purpose and as a Calvinist minister I would say that purpose is the the glory of God and and that and so history is then pulled by the gravity of the telos towards its purpose and it will get there inexorably it will it will get there eventually it, it cannot help but get there at some point and myself being a traditional christian i would say that's how christianity works and so but now we've got sort of a new story about how this happens that they've got the the un the unconditional down here and manifests in the mythos and here in the mythos that's where you'll find the telos but something that would be uh, diminished if you literalized it you would Ah, here's this word literal. If you literalize that, what do you mean? Well, well, what do you mean by that word literal? Because the problem, you know, it, it's so funny because in many of these conversations, you've got the word literal and you've got the word mytho um, metaphorical or mythological. And the problem is on the mythological sign, everyone asserts. The literal sign, we all know what we mean. And I would assert it's completely the opposite. That the mythological is actually based on the arguments that you've been creating about human beings' work. That, so let's use the manifest scientific image. 
Kant dualism here. You've got the manifest image, you've got the scientific image. Which one is literal? Well, you'd say the scientific image is literal and the manifest image is mythological. Mythology belongs to the manifest image. That's where we have desire and telos and all of these things. That all belongs in the in the mani in the manifest image and the, the, the literal belongs in the scientific image. Well, here's our problem. There's no clean room, okay? And and there's no there's no accessing the scientific image in and of itself. And this is where again we, once we see these postmodern arguments, we're all a little bit postmodern. We've got dirty fingerprints on our postmodernity, too. And, and so we talk like, well, they take their mythology literally. And the problem is that they're confusing, they're confusing the two. And yeah, that is a problem sometimes. That is a problem. I think the bigger problem is that you don't really understand what science is. And, and this, is, this is the point postmodernity has been making. And if you're going to be a postmodern Christian, you can't really go back and say, oh, they're taking it literal because there is no literal. Thomas Kuhn's been here. Your science is politics. All you have is metaphorical truth. That's what you've got, except for this, this thing that won't be deconstructed. And guess we're going to have a three-letter word that's going, to, that's going to be very useful for talking about this thing that can't be deconstructed. That will be your... It's kind of like dog, but with the letters switched. I know people get afraid of dogs, but that's where we're going. You would have turned it into a kind of fable or fairy tale or superstitious bit of magic. So much pejorative stuff in there for a postmodernist. But, but I see. See, this is where, this is where, some postmoderns aren't postmodern enough or too modern in their postmodernism. Take it to be saying something that's that's interesting and important if you read it well. If you interpret it properly. Interesting and important, but kind of like, I don't know, is it interesting and important in the way that, oh, well, here's a, here's a, here's a nice little, well, let me, not enough, uh, here's a nice little fictional story about, um, I don't know, uh, I can't think of a single fictional book here in, um, in my mind. Here's a nice little fictional story about a little girl and her brother or something like that where I can learn truths of the universe in it. Or is a sign on the beach saying that there's a great white shark eating people. Is that a, a little fic? No, that one's literal. Oh. Well, what do you mean by that? What What isn't... Is that... See, see right away, these things don't quite hold together and don't literalize it so i'm trying to say there's something don't literalize it uh something important going on in religion that um we, we sort of have to protect religion from itself you know we have to protect religion from literalizing and absolutizing see but but here's the thing modernity came along and did that and and this was modernity's trick, so you have to protect religion from modernity? That's, that's kind of what you're saying. Uh, and confusing the, uh, its unconditional aspiration with the conditional form in which it takes shape. The way it, in a particular book, or a particular tradition, or a particular story. And, and now, if we were to flesh this out... I would say Caputo would probably say, well, and now we're back to the boogeyman of the fundamentalist. That, oh, the, the fundamentalist. The fundamentalist imagines that they, if they act within this mythological story, they can, um, they can realize outcomes and, and achievements within the mythological story. 
but but that's unwarranted because it's only the expression of that which can't be deconstructed okay two problems number one can you see that that which decom is de is is can't be deconstructed without the story up here can you see this thing itself two what is this thing up here for if not to live within in some kind of correspondence to the thing below see in a, in a sense what they're saying is this thing up here this mythos up here that that can't be lived into to you can't imagine this is reality up here because it's from down here. But you, human being, can't touch the down here. And so this is the only place you can live in up here. And in other words, you leave no place for a human being to live. Because human beings, you've been deconstructing, so we're up here. I mean, it's, it's, it's very similar to the manifest image versus scientific image dilemma. Oh, I want to live into in the scientific world. Okay, what's you? You're going to have one heck of a meaning crisis along the way, buddy, because you're up here, something that can be deconstructible, and what can't be deconstructed, you can't know or touch. You're completely disconnected from it. Oh, those fundamentalists, they're, they're taking this stuff too literally. Okay, what world do you leave for them to live in? Which is exactly the point that Jordan Peterson makes. That, okay, so you're beating up on the, you're beating up on the fundamentalists. What world do you want them to live in? And the truth is, you just have a different world that's just like their world. You don't have the world that can't be deconstructed. Because you're deconstructing everything and you're asserting that we look around and we find justice and we can deconstruct that and reconstruct it. Okay, again, back to my Brett Weinstein. Who's we? Because we're all up in here. We're not down here. And this, 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 is, this is, okay, let me deconstruct this move. It's just cruel. And that's exactly the point Jordan Peterson made about the fundamentalists over at Lafayette College when he said, you know, okay, fair enough. Science has been deconstructing this for, for, for the fundamentalists and you're taking away their worldview and you're not giving them anything else. No, we're going to give them justice. Really? Because you're not... You're not seeing their oppression and suffering in the moves you've just made. And you can't argue against their oppression because they're feeling it just as much as all these other special groups that you sanction their oppression and the system itself that differentiates they they are, I am because I'm out feeling oppressive oppression now. There's There's no framework with which to differentiate them. So... What, um, so, I mean, I know you, 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 you wind up saying that, like, uh, if, if, if you ask, uh, you know, the unconditional, I think, is your answer to what, what kind of motivates or draws, uh, this process of deconstruction. And, and so, uh, I think immediately people are going to ask, uh, before we ask you to elaborate a little on what you mean by the unconditional, and here I think things will get challenging probably because you're getting to a pretty fundamental metaphysical level, but I, I, I think people will ask, so are you equating the unconditional with God, with the divine? It, 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 does this correspond to what in, in uh, biblical Christian, traditional Christianity is just called God? In religion, the unconditional goes under the name of God. Okay, so that... So, the, so, so God is the unconditional, but the unconditional is not God, because the unconditional is operative wherever human beings are trying to be human, wherever, they're, wherever they have desires and aspirations. And even when they're not, I'd add, but go on. Uh, which may or may not include the notion of God. The notion of God is... The, the way the word, the, the way the what I call the unconditional shows up in religion. Now, now again, you get back to the James Lindsay piece, and well, your experience of oppression is your God. 
That's the unconditional, and the unconditional which has to be manifest then in a mythos, in the manifest image, and, and therefore this will shape the structures with which you will inhabit and pursue justice, okay? I'm zipping ahead to further in the conversation, but that's where we're going. Is God. And, and in the monotheistic, even then you have to restrict it to the monotheistic religions. Uh, because there are there are traditions that we call religion in our Christian Latin word religion, we call them religion. That you know don't even ha don't have that word. They don't have any good translation for that word, and they don't use the notion of God, like Buddhism, for example. Or they have many gods, uh, and so so they can th things could be the, the, in the study of religion today. The word religion is put in scare quotes. Because it's a it's a Western Latin Christian primarily the word itself is a Western Latin. So you better not use it. What 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 words are you going to use? If you had a better word, wouldn't you trot it out right now? <laughs> so you you've used the word aspiration, um, or or you know dream, and and you're putting a lot of emphasis on on. Our, our, as I understand it, our aspirations, what are the things humans aspire to? What are the things they dream? And you seem to be associated. And again, I can't now listen to a remark like that and not hear John Gray in my ear. You know, humans, this collective, where does that idea come from? That with the unconditional, and I guess I have a couple of questions. One, are you saying that that, that, that is a... Uh, that that's a manifestation of the the unconditional. In other words, is, is that you know to you to switch the terminology? Would you say that's a manifestation of the divine? That if if I have an aspiration, a dream, if I if I think about the future and want it to be a certain way, is that a that's a manifestation of the unconditional, or that's what drives the unconditional, or it's the other way around, the unconditional drives that. What, what, is, the, what is the relationship between the unconditional and, and human aspiration? Uh, well, on the, sub, on the side of the subject, on the side of the desiring self, they're the same thing. But what, my, my deepest, most profound concerns as a uh, person? They're my God. Uh, is a matter of unconditional interest or concern or importance or value to me. Just like the person who's now their identity is their oppression, that becomes their God and then motivates the cloud, the mythology, the mythological cloud, the social expression and all of these things. But that's not to say that it's all something subjective because um, I'm in fact responding to something that is, is on the objective side, is on the side of, of, of the reality itself. So there's an unconditional quali quality in reality itself. There's an unconditional quality beyond my individual self in the, the social whole, the social good. And there's an unconditional quality about the universe, which gives it... Um, the, the, the unconditional on the objective side is the, people, a lot of times people use the expression there's something bigger than us. Okay, well, that's the unconditional. That's, that's this thing which was there before us and will be there long after us, which is uh, absolutely primordial. One philosopher back in the 19th century, a German ph philosopher named Schelling, used a wonderful expression. He called it the unprethinkable. The, the thing that thought can never get behind, it can never get there, it, it got there first. And thinking is always sort of trying to uh, catch up to it. This, is, this, this argument in some ways reminds me of the ontological argument. To, to get there. So on the objective side, there's something, uh, 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 there's an unconditional reality that we'll never quite catch up to which all preceded thought. And if the scientists are right about the future of the universe just expanding into oblivion, it'll be long, it'll be there long after thought dis disappears. Um, there's, so there's an unconditional being or reality that precedes us. 
-hmm. On the objective side, and on the subjective side, there's our own unconditional, what we hold to be of unconditional importance. Now, that, that, that little speech right there got pretty esoteric. Okay, so, so the unconditional is unconditional because its existence and nature are not conditioned on anything we do or even on anything that happens in the world we observe. Yeah, well, think of it like, you know, it's sort of like the, the, the kids, who, when, when the kids, kids are growing up, they keep asking why, 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 why. Well, the, ultimately, there's this thing which is without why. Right. You know, right. Which is the point, what, what, what it's, you care it, about. It's turtles so, all the way down until the unconditional, as the old... Uh, sure. You, yeah. you hit a presupposition that you, you just, there's no answer. There's no, uh, Aristotle says at one point, the mark of education, he uses the word paideia, we get, we get pedagog from that word. The mark of an educated person is to know when to stop asking questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you, because you hit that point, which is... So is this related to what uh, the theologian uh, Paul Tillich called the ground of being? In, in, as I said at the beginning, I'm interested. I never quite could make up my mind whether I wanted to do theology or philosophy. Mm -hmm. the, the theologian who makes the most sense to me is Paul Tillich, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the philosopher who makes the most sense to me is this man Jacques Derrida, who formulated uh, what got to be known as deconstruction. And what's interesting about both of them is that their, their focus ultimately settles on the same word, unconditional. The difference being that in Tillich, this really is theology. He really thinks it's the ground of being, the unconditional is God. Whereas for Derrida, Derrida, you know, is a postmodern philosopher. He's not so sure that we know anything metaphysical. Uh, but he thinks that the unconditional is something that uh, draws us, something that uh, lures us. But he's not prepared to say that it's God or the universe or anything else. You know, he doesn't. He doesn't know. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point. Uh, whereas, from that point of view, Tillich would be more like a modern thinker, because he really thinks there's an ontological foundation for all this. Derrida, as a postmodern who is a little wary of coming up with the big answers, does not. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he thinks that we can, t he thinks the notion of the unconditional is inescapable. Whether it's God or the universe or biology or whatever it is, he doesn't know. He can't, he can't say. But he does think that it's a feature of our, an indelible feature of our experience, mm -hmm. or so, our encounter with the world. Okay, so um, so to get back to this question of the connection between the, uh, between the unconditional and our own aspiration, um, you know, I, and to frame it in the context of the notion of teleology, another telos, in other words, the idea that there is a larger purpose. Uh, to the kind of historical process in which we're embedded, which is a... Well, you may not think that. I mean, you would still have a notion of the unconditional and not think that at all. No, but if, but, but you, you may, but, but, but I gather that in... in, in uh, well, my question is, in, 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 in postmodern Christianity, is the idea that, um, that what, you know, aspiration... I mean, when you think of, you, you know, uh, telos, the idea of uh, something moving toward a purpose can exist at different levels. In a certain sense, it uncontroversial exists at a human level in the sense that we conceive of goals and we pursue them. So we imagine, you know, I imagine that I want to eat. Now, James K. Smith has been coming up more and more in my stuff, and I had a conversation with with Julian yesterday and Julian's been reading a lot of James K. Smith James K. Smith would fit very well into this conversation right here um, currently I just if you follow me on Twitter you know that I tweeted it's a pretty high praise for James most recent the chapter in his most recent book 
on the um, let's see here I forget uh, the third chapter in his most recent book basically on the journey and on Augustine um, because what James K. Smith sees is that these postmodernists are actually working you know they're actually engaging Augustine because Augustine this gets into the tourists versus pilgrims too in the the Rod Dreer piece pilgrims have a destination they have a telos they're going somewhere they're being drawn to a home without this 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 non deconstructible which which what is it the id is it our angst at least the 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 little ones that reside inside all of us these they just they're simply wanters now i've been in my in my sunday series i've been working through the book of first peter and and first peter along with paul and others in the new testament very much work on on this Greek word epithumia, which is over desires, and part of the framing of of a lot of arguments in the New Testament is that what destroys human beings, and, and again, Stoics will this won't be unfamiliar to people who are familiar with Stoicism, that we have these epithumias that 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 destroy our lives, and and that what Christ does is now the Holy Spirit displaces these over desires that we have. But and, and so obviously this is this is where Augustine comes in and and Augustine talks about you know our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. And and so we you know all of all of the manifestations, the mythos, the manifest image that we are participating in here, this is all restless until it finally comes into perfect communion with that which can't be reduced. And you'll have this a little bit later, and I might jump through some of this art here, because where John Caputo's postmodern Christianity will then focus on justice. Fair enough. And the vision of justice is that justice is a, is a longing thing. You know, we long for justice, and that's, that's the rest we are looking for. Here's, here's the chapter in, in his book, um, A Refugee Spirituality. And, and as I said, with if you're, Julian's a pretty sharp guy. And, and what's particularly impressive about Julian is he's not going to college. And I remember when I first met Julian a couple years ago, uh, James, who is on our local meetup here and teaches at a junior college, basically, you know, basically said college doesn't deserve him. And not, not that there's a few things Julian couldn't learn at college, but Julian's been reading a lot of James K. Smith. And James K. Smith, when he was on Rebel Wisdom, you know, didn't have some very nice things to say about Jordan Peterson, who, of course, is a um, pretty important piece in the story of the uh, development of rebel wisdom and and what they're doing but uh, for for smith he's smith just did actually an article in world magazine maybe i'll pick that up Th those of you who know something about conservative evangelical christianity know that world magazine is a conservative magazine in reformed circles evangelical circles did a major piece on james k smith interviewed by martin olasky who is the editor there and james actually has is using this image for his twitter feed uh, very interesting article um talking about you know james fairly fairly transparent in terms of his own personal life and his you know augustine's father his um, his James's father. It's very interesting that James is working. James is working the postmodernity. I mean, one of his earlier books, "Who's Afraid of Who's Afraid of Postmodernity." He, he's really sort of seeing some of these Derrida, Foucault, in the light of Augustine, 
and um, Heidegger as well. Heidegger, uh, James K. Smith did quite a bit of work in Heidegger. And it, it's very interesting how he is sort of taking these and, you know, coming around uh, with Augustine with them. And this is with John Verveke's background in, in Neoplatonism. I, I would like to see John and Jamie Smith have a conversation again, but I hope they have they would know enough of each other's work to have a productive conversation. But it's, it's, it's very interesting to me listening, listening to Caputo do this. And again, as a reformed Christian, Luther, of course, was an Augustinian monk. Um, John Calvin, if there was a guiding light that John Calvin was trying to follow, it was Augustine. Um, there's some good memes about Calvinism and Augustine out there on the uh, on the internet. You can look them up yourself. So, uh, postmodernity, part of what James is doing in his book on the road with Augustine, is is connecting the existentialists and the postmodern together with Augustine. And again, I think this this chapter in his book on the road with Augustine, uh, refugee spirituality. I think it's a tremendous chapter I'm um, going through his book on audiobook and again I, I haven't I've, I've been a fan of a lot of his ideas I haven't necessarily been a fan of a lot of his writing that, that but I thought this chapter in this book was I thought it was outstanding it hit me well and and it's been helping me sort of put some things together here Okay, back to the video. In a certain sense, it uncontroversial <clears throat> exists at a human level in the sense that we conceive of goals and we pursue them. So we imagine, you know, I imagine that I want to eat this, this macaroni. I go buy it. I eat it. There's a sense in which I was being drawn into the future by my ability to conceive it. There's a sense in which that's teleological. But, but in the, in the, so my aspiration has an uncontroversial kind of micro kilos in it, but then the, but then the, the it, religion, some religions raise the question of whether there's a larger telos at work and all of history is subordinate to some goal. And I guess I'm asking is, is, is with postmodern Christianity, is the answer yes. And the key mechanism somewhere in this connection between the unconditional and individual human aspiration. No, I, don't, I, I see. That's, that's why I, I, I said that I don't think that you're ten, you're bound to any kind of es, any kind of teleological notion of history. Uh, did you want to say eschatological? Because he's a theologian too. Because he knows that word. I mean, the, as far as we can tell, the best information we have available, this civilization of ours, and this Earth, and this solar system, and this galaxy, are headed for oblivion. This move, when he made this, because I was, you know, there, there's a reason Robert Wright, especially, you know, if you do some Googling with Robert Wright and some of his own personal stuff, his pushing on this point here, I found fascinating. And then this move by Caputo, I found, what's, how, it was predictable because Okay, this is this is one of these areas where if you're an academic, this is so. There's these, you know. I've been watching some of the Peter Thiel stuff, and there there are certain things. There are certain things that you say, certain areas that if you these boundary markers here, and one of them there is their purpose to the universe, and he says no by. We by all by all purpose we can tell that there's no the universe is heading to oblivion and and it's like I want to just pull in C. S. Lewis's Life in an Atomic Age, uh, pull in N. T. Wright talking to Peter Thiel and that that's part of the reason I didn't get a video out this Tuesday was too many videos in my head and I can't when I have too many videos I want to do at the one time they kind of keep jostling and you know nothing gets born. But and so Caputo here, no, there's no, there's no purpose. It's this is, and so then, then you're like, well, okay. Well, 
we're 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 left here. We're left here. We're adrift. And and the the purpose that you know Robert Wright noted, well we have purpose individually and we and you know law Christianity has long asserted that there's this purpose up here and well purpose is part of this manifest image. We know by science that that isn't there and it's like well, 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 who who is taking what literally now? That, that's a, an astronomy that was unavailable to antiquity. The, the Saint Paul thought that the world consisted mostly in uh, in, in uh, the Middle East and 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 uh, the a Asia Minor, and then way out on the limits of the universe was this place that we call Spain. Well, I would assume that is true, but now he's about to make the argument that I think N.T. Wright pretty ably handles in his Gifford lectures about the immanentism, which itself came up in the 19th century. That, oh, this is this is what they all believed. And, you know, and, and so, okay, well, there is no purpose. It's like, well, how do you know? I mean, suddenly skeptics start pulling out cards. Well, we, we don't have this card, we don't have that card, we don't have these cards because, well, we can't know these things. Well, you just said a pretty big thing that I'd, 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 be, I'd find it more respectable if you say, well, we can't tell if there's purpose to the universe or not. See, and, and again, Peterson at least was more honest in being an open agnostic about these things, but... No, there's no purpose. Well, how do you know? Maybe that's another part of this that is that is deconstructible. I think I can deconstruct it. And then you're left with, well, I, I don't know if there's purpose or not. And if you don't know if there's purpose or not, well, then it's legitimate to act as if there is. So now we're going to get to Boltmann, and again, go go watch N.T. Wright's Gifford lectures. Completely different world, right? And then there was this man, Boltmann, who came along in the 20th century and said, look, if you want to understand the scriptures, you got to get rid of the old astronomy that they, they had and, and understand that after you've done that, that there's still something there. A lot of people say there isn't anything there. And, and again, okay, so now, so Boltmann comes along and says, oh, well, but I think Boltmann is an interesting person to bring into this because a little bit later, what we're going to again get to is, you know, when, when Christopher Masto Pietro says, you know, we see the sun, you know, we see the sun receding into the distance and what you have by a group of philosophers and theologians for the last couple of hundred years is a frantic attempt to can we can we keep it from going too far and so now caputo is deconstructing all of this stuff so the notion of a an end of history when god would come and establish his rule on earth forever the earth is done is going to be here forever the earth has got about 500 million years in it left or so and and then that'll be that so I don't think that there is uh, any such thing as historical teleology, that history uh, has some teros that is by which it is divinely, towards which it is divinely guided. Okay, so no telos, but then how should we live? What should we do? Towards which it is divinely guided. I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that's the mythical form in which it's found in the scriptures, but I don't think that that's true. What? That's the that's the husk. So so, but now you have the problem that okay, so we've got the stuff in the scriptures that's true, and, and this just lends itself back into the modernist fundamentalist view. We have the stuff in the scriptures that well, we get we can get rid of these things. Well, then, what do you think? is the true stuff you can pull out of there? Because, again, we're going to get to that. What I think is the, the scriptures are telling us stories about something important in our lives, and they're to be read the way you would read literature. When you read 
What kind of literature? Is all literature the same? A great novel uh, is telling you something important, deeply true, but it's in the fiction section of the library. See, and then here, pulled line right out of Sam Harris here. And I think that the scriptures are like that. You'd have to put them in the literature section of, of the library, in the religious literature section, but they're literature. And they're saying something important. But what they're not doing is giving us a picture of the universe. The people who wrote them... Were... They're not giving us a picture of the universe. I would argue literature gives us a picture of the universe. What kinds of pictures are we talking about? They're not cosmologists. They didn't know anything about the nature of the universe. They were not historic. They don't know anything about the nature of the universe? They didn't know anything about the history of the human race. Don't know anything about the history of the human race? Now, the, the problem with this approach is people who are enormous skeptics now suddenly know all these things. And it's like, well, I would say they knew some things, they didn't know other things. We know some things, we don't know other things. Um, there's going to be a lot of knowing and unknowing all over the place. But to just sweep it away... And they had no basis whatsoever to talk about the end and the purpose of the human race. Had no basis at all to talk about that. Well, do you have basis to dismiss it? But they were still saying something that's important. How do you know? How, how, how could they get these other things completely wrong and these other things right? Well, maybe we can get bunches of things wrong and some things right. So I didn't, I didn't have no, I don't subscribe to any theological notion of history. I mean, and, 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 of, what's the most concise formulation of what they were saying that's important? Well, it depends. See, again, I think Wright does an excellent job in this interview. Depending on who you were talking about, the prophets, the most important thing the prophets were talking about was justice, the rule of, rule of justice. Uh, in some of the older books of the scriptures, what the, the most important thing they were establishing, interested in was establishing the rule of of uh, the people of God, of, of, of Israel, of Yahweh, and of making sure that nobody messed with Yahweh. And, and, and now, okay, but again, there's not justice in the, Mosaic, in the Mosaic law. That isn't an attempt at justice, that, that there's not expression of justice in the prophets. And so, well, now, well, we're going to pick the prophets. Well, why? Is it, can we deconstruct your selection of the prophets? Because all of this selecting we're doing is deconstructible, right? And so justice, what is that? Well, they'd be sorry. Mm -hmm. So they, that was a very nationalistic uh, idea of uh, what, what, what... The prophets weren't nationalistic? We call their religion. But it evolved, and when you, by the time you get to the prophets... Uh, and, and again, it evolved, what does that mean? Well, it meant it got better. Okay, well... Is it going to keep getting better? Um, then they're starting to think in terms of uh, universal justice, the messianic age, peace. Mm -hmm. And um, in the New Testament, you see the, it's the prophetic stream of the, uh, Christian, of the Jewish scriptures which shows up in the New Testament under the notion of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is an amazing place, right? It's a, it's a place where where hatred is greeted with love, hostility with forgiveness. And if there's the kingdom of God, there's the outside the kingdom of God, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, too. The weak are, uh, the, the meek in, inherit the earth. Uh, the, the, the ver everything's upside down. It's a, it's a topsy-turvy world. So it's a, po it's, it's a poetic vision of life that philosophers themselves would be less in time, would, be, would not come up with. Mm -hmm. Philosophers would think in terms of an order, of an order established by rational uh, agreement and rational consensus. Whereas what you see in the scriptures is a, is a much more uh, poetic vision of life, a, a much crazier vision of life. It's, a, it's sort of a, an Alice in Wonderland, topsy-turvy, uh, life, where 
the last are first, and the outsiders are, into, are, are invited in, and the insiders are invited out, and the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It's a, it's a radical vision of, uh, a revolutionary vision of, uh, of life. Okay. That's... Oh, wait, wait, revolutionary? Where have I heard this before in this conversation? Wait a minute. There's, there's, the, there's the status quo, and then there's the revolution, and then there's the new. So, again, I mean, again, that's not a, it's not a bad thing, but this whole thing has, in fact, tell us, because the purpose of the revolution is what? Well, this aspirational better world. Well, where does that come from? Well, there can't be any telos over there. So, you know, C.S. Lewis's you 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 castrate the horse, you you castrate the the horse and bid it produce. Um, you you it's telos all over the place now. Is this is this just is this just what you want? I mean. That's, I think, uh, the, the story it's telling. That's its, uh, its vision, and it's impossible vision, right? You can't, you can't run a railroad like that, but it's a vision that interrupts the way we do tend to run our railroads. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you why I asked the question about teleology. I was listening to one of your lectures. You were talking about this uh, process of kind of repeated deconstruction that, that uh, in a way... Um, constitutes a lot of what we mean by history and you ask the question these are not i was i was taking notes these aren't quite direct quotes but you were asking when you ask what uh what drives the process you, you were asking questions like uh what is calling to us what are we called by right you put things in terms of calling beckoning is it being as if you're being beckoned into the future and of course if you look at the prevailing non-teleological view of history in the world today, which is basically science, maybe scientific materialism, adherents of that view would say, why are you even asking questions like what is calling to us? They would say, look, it's, it's, it's uh, everything that happens is a result of prior causes. So that, you know, the, the it's, things are just being pushed into the future. They're not being pulled anywhere. That's kind of the standard non-teleological framework, but you're using uh, clearly different language than a scientist would, would use to when you ask what is driving the process. And the language seems to be about, I mean, first of all, it the, the word calling is itself suggestive in a religious context because of this notion that we all have some role to play, right? That's divinely, uh, that originates in the divine in some sense. Um, but, but also it's just it, there is this idea of being called into the future, right? So, uh, and that to me is suggestive of, 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 of teleology, right? You can, see, you can see where I'm coming from. Yeah, but, with, but without some notion of, of an ultimate telos that's drawing everything, both nature and, and humanity forward. I mean, I mean, look at science. Science is, is, is goal-driven. It's, 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 it's driven by scientific... And again... Science is goal-driven. I'd say scientists are goal-driven. But what is science? And, and again, you, you see how this, this just doesn't cohere. Projects, and right now, it's driven, it's driven and driven by the goal of a unified theory. So why? Because the math is better, right? Because it's cleaner, because it coheres. Scientific work would not uh, happen were were they not puzzled by conflicts and anomalies and difficulties and problems um, which they're trying to resolve. Um, that's not to say well, suddenly scientists got back in it. Human science is the goal of the universe. It's to say that our our life is in denying some that we we could in any way know or posit some ultimate tailors i'm not denying uh, something that's very important to me and that is the notion of our futuricity of, of, of the futural nature of human existence so so here we bump into again one of these you know not doing this for a couple of years one of these lines of demarcation 
in the secular frame that human beings are the only things that we are affording purpose that there's no that any purposes we see above us or beyond us are things that we project up into it they're not there actually they don't exist because there's nothing to put them there and and so well i sometimes i get caught talking like this but don't really mean it and so purposive activities and goals and calling and mission these are all things that in an, in poetic moments i'll talk about and because i i enjoy them and they they feel good to me but finally every project that i make oh what do we know by science that the universe 500 million years ago it all goes poof you just You're just begging people to not have a purpose in life. Oh, here's a little purpose you can have. Just play around with it. Anything will do. Well, what about justice? Well, that's a good one. Okay. What about making myself happy, pleasuring my way in any way I would want? That gives a lot of purpose and aim and goals. Well, well, that one doesn't go as far as justice. Why not? Well, maybe there's something built into the world that is actually pointing in a way, and maybe the stuff up here is actually connected to that which can't be deconstructed down here. And and maybe my my little experience of oppression is is insufficient to 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 even build one measly human life upon. Maybe e even that there's something within a human life that has more majesty that 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 my experience is insufficient to justify we are uh, unfinished beings we are open-ended beings and deconstruction is the theory of keeping us unfinished keeping us open and not letting things free, freeze over or or impress it it's a, it's a theory of de, de uh, crustacean you know, breaking. So we're tourists. We're not pilgrims. We're not heading anywhere. We're just wandering. And when we get to a place, it's like, oh, well, good enough for me. So again, I woke up early this morning. And if I wake up early, I don't want to bother my wife. And so I'll often just put in an audio book and listen to something or a video or something early on. So I don't, you know, get out of bed and disturb her and ruin the ru ruin the rest that she needs and i read this chapter and um we cultivate indifference as a cocoon we make irony a habit because the safety of maintaining a knowing distance works as a defense if you can't find what matters conclude that nothing matters if the hunger for home is always and only frustrated decide the road is life such a consensus is cultivated, is the cultivated posture of Merceau, I don't speak French, the anti-hero at the center of Albert Camus' breakout novel, The Stranger. He exhibits an odd aloofness from the very beginning. He can't remember which day his mother died. The day after receiving the telegram, he's laughing and frolicking with Marie and the Mediterranean Sea. Puzzled when he puts on a black tie, Marie asks in jest, whether he's mourning. I told her Maman had died. She wanted to know how long ago. I said yesterday. She gave a little start, but didn't say anything. I felt like telling her it wasn't my fault, but I stopped myself because I remembered that I'd already said that to my, I'd already said that to my boss. I didn't mean any, it didn't mean anything. Besides, you always feel a little guilty and are. Later in the novel, his guilt well, um, his guilt well established, Merceau is imprisoned. But this is only an intensification of how he has always experienced the burden of life. Like Socrates practicing to die, Merceau has unwittingly spent a life learning to be guilty, denied his freedom. When I was first imprisoned, the hardest thing was that my thoughts were still those of a free man. I still had. I still had these silly ideas of telos, 
pulling me into the future. I was still living in the mythologies instead of the one thing that can't be deconstructed. For example, I would suddenly have the urge to be on a beach and walk down to the water. I imagined the sound of the first waves under my feet, my body entering the water and the sense of relief it would give me. All of a sudden, I would feel just how closed how closed in I was by the walls of my cell, but that was only lasted a few months. Afterwards, my only thoughts were those of a prisoner. When all you'll see is the walled yard, decide that walking around within it is the only journey that could ever make you happy. I think in many ways, that's where, that's where, that's where this postmodern Christianity, there's no telos up there, but I can talk about calling and passion down here. I'm in the prison. When your only visitor is your lawyer, convince yourself hell is other people. When happiness eludes you, believe that eschewing happiness makes you happy. You can learn to stifle the stubborn suggestions otherwise, as Merceau learned during the, during the incessant drone of his trial. Through all the interminable days and hours that people had spent talking about my soul, he said, I could hear through the expanse of chambers and courtrooms an ice cream vendor blowing his tin trumpet out in the street. I was assailed by memories of a life that wasn't mine anymore, but one in which I'd found the simplest and most lasting joys, the smell of summer. The part of the town I loved, in a certain evening sky, Marie's dresses and the way she laughed, the utter pointlessness of whatever I was doing seized my throat and all I wanted to get over with, and all I wanted was to get it over with and to get back to my cell and sleep. The journey is one of our oldest tropes for the adventure of being human. In many cases, the template was Odyssean, departure and return, adventure and homecoming, from bon voyage to welcome home. Even the lament, You Can't Go Home Again by Thomas Wolfe rehearses the, the Odyssean itinerary by trying to get back. But the adventure of Camus' exile was not Odyssean. It is Sisyphean. Joy is... Pre, joy is is predicated on the impossibility of arrival. In the myth of Sisyphus, Camus describes the experience of one for whom the illusion of rationality has been peeled back. In a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, a man feels an alien, a stranger. His exile is without remedy since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home or the hope of a promised land. The world is inhuman, indifferent to us, and there are days, moments, seasons when its aloof strangeness swells to encompass our vision, and we experience a vertigo, like looking at the Mediterranean on a cloudy day and the horizon vanishes in a bright gray. If man realized that the universe, like him, can love and suffer, Camus remarks, he would, re he would be reconciled, but the world refuses." Caputo says, we can't believe that world because science tells us in 500 million years it will be gone. Good thing I'll be dead before that. The strange disaffection bleeds into me if I sit still long enough. Likewise, the stranger who at certain, at certain seconds comes to meet us in a mirror, the familiar and yet alarming brother we encounter in our own photographs is also the absurd. A stranger to myself and to the world, armed solely with a thought that negates itself as soon as it asserts. What is the condition in which I can have peace only by refusing to know and to live? In which the appetite for conquest bumps into walls that defies its assaults. The condition is exile and happiness is embracing it relinquishing any nostalgia for home and any hope for arrival. The absurd one is the one who manages to make exile what he always wanted. The feat, the trick, is to learn how to live without appeal. Exile is the kingdom. The hell of the present is his kingdom at last. Imagine Sisyphus as a pilgrim caught in a loop, arrival always eluding him, accomplishments perpetually undermined, Sisyphus is the absurd hero for Camus because he embraces this perpetual pilgrimage of futility. It is during that return, that pause, that Sisyphus interests me, Camus admits. 
When the stone has rolled away again, Sisyphus pra Camus praises Sisyphus for his trudge back down the mountain, left at the foot of the mountain, the rock rolling back every time. Sisyphus man manufactures joy in the effort. All Sisyphus' sil all Sisyphus's silent joy is contained therein. His fate belongs to him. His rock is his thing. He's never going to arrive, never reaching the other shore, never getting to stay on the top of the mountain, but the struggle itself towards the height is enough to find a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. Must? I'm right there with James K.A. Smith there. Must? Must one imagine Sisyphus happy? In my tweets this morning about this, when I was, when I was um, lauding the chapter on Twitter... I, I, I went back to Jordan Peterson's conversation with, with David Fuller at Rebel Wisdom in that interview he gave where at the end of it, David Fuller, I had mentioned to David Fuller, there's a stoic quality to Peterson because you're dragging that cross up the hill. Well, where are you taking that cross, Jordan? Jordan says, well, as Paul hasn't heard the places I've talked, it's the kingdom of God. Ah. We are back with Augustine. But Jordan, do you ever reach the kingdom of God? Because after all, if you listen to Jordan, he'll tell you, well, it's in the, the meaning is the pulling of the cross up the hill. Yes, there's meaning there. But the meaning is knowing that there is a destination. And for Jordan, who tells the story of the Nazi camp where it's dragging the the sack of sawdust or sand back and forth across the flat factory floor just to make the point that there is no point. Because, of course, Augustine says there is another city. But imagine Camus' philosophy as a message to actual migrants, to those who risk their lives today in boats submerged to the gunwales, ferrying, see, he plays on... So Camus was Algerian, goes to Paris, finds himself a stranger. Augustine, of course, another North African in Hippo, Carthage, that area, goes to Rome, finds himself an alien. So Smith is playing on that. But imagine Camus' philosophy is a message to an actual migrant. A refugees across Camus' prized Mediterranean, all too often failing to arrive. Or imagine young parents, toddlers in tow, harrowing a journey, a harrowing journey from murderous Honduras to the southern border of the United States, parched and depleted by the desert journey, trying to cross its fabled line to apply for asylum, only to be refused and returned again over and over. Is that bearing the cross? Surely you have a sense of meaning as you're making your way to, to the promised land. But Hebrews 11, surely there must be a home whose builder is from God. No, we can't believe that. All we can have is, if you tell me that, well, I'll stay in my mom's basement covered with Cheetos dust sitting playing computer games because there's no point to going forward. And okay, fair enough. It's, it's, it's meaningful to clean your room. But a la Augustine, the ordered room is gives us a sacramental connection to the final ordering. Or do, or do such Sisyphean philosophies that the road is life turn out to be bourgeois luxuries um, indulged by those safe enough to pretend that this is all there is? Miroslav Volf, the extent of, of oh, forget, exclusion and embrace. I know we're, I can think of the, I can think of the book when I can locate it in my, in my, in my office. Does the hunger and hope of the migrant show us something more fundamentally human? Maybe our craving for rest, refuge, arrival. Home is a hunger that can't be edited. The heart an obstinate, obstinate palimpsest. That, that's, that's a document that's been bleached and rewritten, but sometimes we want to find the, 
so we want to find the original document that someone thought they'd reuse the they'd reuse the papyrus or they they'd reuse the skin to put it on top if there's a map inscribed in the human heart that shows where home is in fact that we that we haven't yet arrived doesn't make it a fiction it might just mean that there's a way that we haven't tried maybe camus gave up too soon Augustine, his fellow African, might be a better guide. The alienation is real. The sense of frustration, futility of never arriving, never feeling settled with ourselves. These are not figments of the imagination to be papered over with pious assertions of homecoming. The way out of the experience of being fractured and fragmented and ill at ease in our own skin is neither Sisyphean redescription nor some born-again leapfrog out of the vagaries of the human condition. Now he's dealing with the evangelicals, or at least certain reductionistic evangelicals. If there's a way out, our way home, a way to oneself, it has to be a way through what Camus confronts. If Camus is honest about what Heidegger calls angst, the anxiety that emerges in such moments, calling into question everything that we consider to be homey, faux comfort from our absorption in the world. In fact, he in fact Heidegger himself, echoing Freud, describes this productive, unveiling anxiety as, I can't speak German either, as uncanny but even more literally, not at homeness. When we're fooled ourselves into thinking we're at home with distraction, tricked ourselves into feeling settled only because we've sold our home hunger for entertainments, then the eruption of the uncanny, a sense of not at homeness, becomes a gift that creates an opening to once again face the question of who we are. Angst's disturbing disclosure of meaninglessness is a door to walk through. It opens onto the possibility of finding yourself. Not at homeness could be the place from which you finally hear the call to be yourself. If Camus arrives, now notice the secret sacred self. Well, what 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 happens? So if you follow. If you follow postmodernity through this, and if you go to where Caputo goes, there's no there there. And so all you're left with is the secret sacred self because there's no purpose. And so now what the Apostle Paul and what Augustine would wind up saying is, well, then you're just left at the mercies of either the spirits abroad or the, the epithumia, the, the over-desires inside and we're still alienated from ourselves, a la the existentialist, from the world. We're still, well, finding ourselves in the prison walls. Like Camus, Augustine was an African who ventured to Europe looking to make a name for himself, to arrive in both senses of the world, therefore securing his identity. And like Camus, he found there was only a new sense of alienation. A provincial in the centers of cultural influence, first Rome, then Milan, he realized the limits of his welcome in the upper echelons of power. As the biographer Peter, Ground, Peter Brown reminds us, even the fully Latinized African in the 4th century remained somewhat alien. The opinion of the outside world was unanimous. Africa, in their opinion, was wasted on the Africans. His accent is suspicious, a stubborn hayseed halo around his eloquence. Even when he achieves employment in the emperor's court, he surrounds himself with old friends from Africa who provide him with an outpost of Tagaste, and that was his hometown, amid the busyness of Milan. He'll never be at home there. But when he returns to Africa, he finds himself suspect there now too. I had a conversation with Shelley today. Those of you on the Discord server know her, and we talked about third culture kids. Very much the same thing. His meteoric rise through the Roman channels of power is assigned to some African compatriots, burghers and donatists, that he's gone over to the other side. He is tainted with foreignness, even, even at home now. So he is caught between worlds, between classes, falling through the cracks of belonging by virtue of his emigration and return. Indeed, one can describe him the ways weak. That was an earlier story in this chapter that I that I skipped over, describes the fellow traveler as amphibian between two worlds. 
For Augustine, this experience turns out to be a hermeneutic key to the human condition, a place from which he read the Bible, understood himself, and grasped something about humanity's cosmic sojourn. In a provocative, creative, anachronistic proposal, historian Justo Gonzalez sees in Augustine the makings of a mestizo and suggests that this experience of tenuous hybridity was both a burden and a fund for theological creativity. Gonzalez summarizes the concept. To be a mestizo is to belong to two realities, and at the same time to not belong to either of them. A Mexican-American reared in Texas among people of Euro-American culture is repeatedly told that he is a Mexican. Same with many Asians in California. That is, what he does not really belong in Texas. But if that mestizo, or <laughs> Dutch immigrant Canadians in the 1950s, if that mestizo American crosses the border hoping to find there his own land and his people, he's soon disappointed by being rejected or at least criticized as somewhat Americanized or, as Mexicans would say, for being pocho. Augustine's restlessness, Gonzalez observes, was not due only to his distance from God, as he tells us in his confessions, but also to the inner struggles of a person in whom the two cultures, two legacies, two world visions classed and mingled, in short of a mestizo. Even Augustine's home was a hybrid, which prepared him for his later experiences as emigration and return, all informing a theology of Christian life that is, that is, that is as one of migration, a quest for a home no one has ever seen. Joy is arriving at the home you've never been to. And you can hear C.S. Lewis's further up, further in, the joy of discovering in the last battle, the Narnia they've always known and longed for. And you find there haunted C.S. Lewis's argument by desire. We, we, we seem to have tastes for another place that we've never been before. Well, of course, C.S. Lewis also gets it from Augustine, and Augustine, of course, also gets it from the book of Hebrews. How much more will I read? It's a long chapter, but it's, again, I this was um, probably my favorite chapter I've ever read from, from his book. I know some of you who like certain of my series are always worried I'll abandon them and your fears are well-founded, but the end of The Good Place is very much connected to this as well. And I don't necessarily want to spoil it because I'm, I I, I kind of don't want to finish up talking about the good place until season four is on Netflix, the final season, because I know some of you in other places have trouble seeing it, and I'm kind of holding off for then. But what what so and this this kind of draws into Peter Thiel and progress in the future because. If you, if you look at what Robert Wright is saying to is saying to Caputo, okay, there's the push, but is there the pull of the future? And, and in a sense, any notion of progress, which which Caputo continues to continues to defer to, is in many ways premised on the pull of the future. That that history isn't just a piling up upon. But history is a journey, and it's not just a walk around. You're not a tourist; you're a pilgrim. And so, the end of the end of of, of Smith's chapter. But if the road has the road has beat you down, if the sights have become predictable and tired, and there are nights that you look at your friends in the car and wonder, "What the hell are we doing? Please let me out." If you're weary from the chase, broken by the journey, tired of the disappointment, unsettled by a sense that you'll like to find that you'd like to find some rest, not in accomplishment but in welcome, then Augustine might be the stranger you could travel with for a while. Not because he's going to blow sunshine and tell you feel good stories, not because he's going to he's going to fast track you to to rest. Beware of any religious types who roll up in a DeLorean promising time travel to either a nostalgic past or a pristine future. Augustine is the perfect guy for the road because he's been on, and it is sympathetic to all of our angst on the way. There's almost nothing you're going to tell him that he hasn't already heard. You'd be surprised by what a patient listener he is. He was born on the road, and he's been and he's 
and he's seen right through the road is life philosophy. He knows who he is, whose he is, and where he's heading, and almost everything he writes is an effort to help fellow migrants on the way to find an orientation that feels like peace. You might, you might think of Augustine as offering a hitchhiker's guide to the cosmos for wandering hearts. And what's more, Augustine will tell you to take up your cross and pull it up that hill. But Augustine will also say, I have seen, I have been to the mountaintop. And I have a taste of the city of God. And that city has been haunting and driving us not to simply wander. Not all who, those who wander are lost a la Strider, but that there is a destination. And although, although we can't produce it here and now, because it's not a thing that we can wield or an outcome we achieve, it is something that we in fact participate in and affords us as pilgrims a destination and a home of rest. And that's where I'm decidedly unpostmodern or post postmodern because if I listen to the postmoderns, just as if I listen to the atheist modernists, they don't give me a reason not to imagine this and not to follow Augustine. So there we are. I didn't have a roadmap for this, but wound up in the book that I was reading when I woke up this morning. I hope it was helpful.